So good to see everyone this morning. Uh, if you do not know, I'm Bill Savage, the pastor here, and just super excited uh, to share this message uh, with you this morning, especially uh, here in this um, last uh, week, eight days, um, that we are getting ready uh, for Christmas. Um, who is completely done with everything that needs to be done for Christmas? Okay, Randy, I know why you're done, because Kathy's doing it all, so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, here's, here's what I know. After uh, 13, I think 13 Christmases now as senior pastor, here's what I know. You're going to need some joy to finish this race called Christmas, Okay. <laughs> You're going to need some joy, Uh, not happiness, but you're going to need joy, because joy comes from the Lord. Um, Happiness is conditional, it's situational. Uh, Joy comes from the Lord. And so uh, today, I want to jump in here uh, to a very common passage around Christmas time, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 11 is all we're going to cover this week. Um, again, next week as you come, room, uh, no nursery, no kids' church, no toddler rooms. Mother's room will will be open, but we're all going to be out here together as a family. And so, uh, uh, chapter two, verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The angel said, I bring to you good news of great joy. The word joy here in Greek is megos. It's where we get our word mega from. All I'm saying is, is that if you were with us a couple years ago during mega sports camp, mega man brought joy. I'm just saying that, okay? It's not coincidence. The Lord knew what he was doing. Uh, But in, in Greek, the word is megos. And, and so if, if we really want to look at it with understanding that part of Scripture, we would need to know this, is that the good news the angel proclaimed was not just good news of joy, it was good news of mega joy. This was literally the biggest thing that came to the human race in that time, Nothing else has this description in Scripture or since then. Nothing else is going to be able to bring the joy like this. This time of year, we sing things like joy to the world, joyful and triumphant. Tis the season to be jolly. Uh, uh, but, but the thing is, is that real joy eludes so many people. And here's the sad thing is that Real joy eludes so many followers of Christ. I don't get it. I don't get how during this time of the year we can lose our joy. There may be some things that we don't want to do, that we don't like to do okay, but we shouldn't turn in to another person this time of year. We we should be reminded of what this is. Uh, uh, it's, it's not really news to many of us that this, this season does bring some difficult things for people and for family. No doubt that um, issues like depression can increase this time of year. Issues like loneliness can increase this time of year. Um, mental health struggles can increase this time of year. But it's not, look, that is not just a world thing. That's a people thing. And even within the kingdom of God, even within the local church, the same struggle is still there. 
where um, Christ followers um, somehow channel Scrooge or the Grinch or whatever the case is there, uh, um, where people feel stressed out, worn out, burnt out. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not going to go into mental health and those things very much except to just say this. Uh, uh, um, don't ignore it. Don't ignore your mental health this time of the year. If you're curious about where I stand as pastors, there's several sermons online that I've done uh, where it's, it's pretty cut and dry uh, where this is. But listen, uh, um, don't ignore it. Okay? So, Three ways to keep your joy this Christmas. I'm going to give you three because that's probably all that you're going to be able to retain this week. Uh, First is uh, to give your worries to God. No doubt, worry is one of the biggest thieves of joy for people. It's one of those things that everything about worry is about the things that are out of your control. It's, it's things that we can't do anything about. It, it's, it's very hard to be joyful when stress and worry and all those things come up. In the original language, worry is made up of two words that mean to divide the mind. Those words are marizo and naus. Marizo and naus. It means to divide the mind. That's what worry does. Worry divides our mind. Worry divides the mind between positive thoughts and damaging thoughts. It's not just bad thoughts. It's not just not good thoughts. It literally, worry causes damaging thoughts. Damage to your body, your physical body. People can get physically sick from worry. Causes... causes damage to relationships and those other things. If we look at Matthew chapter 6, Jesus had a few things to say about this. In uh, verse 25, he said, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is it not more than food and the body, sorry, is, is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Uh, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. So many people love that verse and we quote that verse and we're like, yeah, I just got to seek first. You ever thought about checking out the next verse? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Stop cherry-picking scriptures. Look at it all. And if we're going to tell people that, you know what? If you really want what God has for you, you've got to seek first his kingdom and all those things will be added unto you, but you also can't worry about it because you haven't sought God and have him first if worry is in place. That's why both of those scriptures are there. Here's, here's one thing that I know is that if, if we're followers of Christ, we're God's children. I love to tell people all the time, I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God that has been disciplined a lot over the years. But I'm also a child of God that's done some things right over the years. I'm a child of God where I know I've brought some disappointment to God, but I know there's times that I've brought joy to God as well. But he is still the same. And here is the thing is that if we truly believe that we're children of God, if you're telling people that you're children of God, then have the joy that comes only from the Lord. Or stop telling people that. Kids, uh, for For those of us here in this room, not everywhere, not worldwide, not every location, but for the people here, our kids aren't worrying about where to sleep, what to eat, what to wear to school, whether or not those things are going to happen. They don't worry about those things because they know who their provider is. They know that maybe even if it is a single mom, that she's a hardworking single mom and she's doing all she can. But we need to take that same thought to God and say, God, you're my provider. 
I don't need to worry about where the bill money is going to come from. I don't need to worry about where those things are going to come from. I don't need to worry about what the gifts I can buy for people or buy for my kids or those things. Now, God may also be saying, put a budget in place. God may also be saying, lay off the Starbucks. God may also be saying, uh, cook at home more often. Okay, so we're like, yeah, God's my provider. God's also our director. He'll direct us to, man, y'all were shouting for provider, but the rest, you're like, oh, he had to go. This is Christmas, pastor. Where's your joy? My joy is in the Lord and all of the truth that comes from him. Now, here's the reality is that turning to God isn't a natural reflex. It's just not. Uh, when, whenever you think about natural reflex, versus condition reflex. Any athletes in the room, you're going to know what this is, okay? You don't really even have to be an athlete as well because if I took a ball and I threw it at Joe, his natural reaction is gonna be to try to stop the ball. That's a natural reaction. That's something that comes natural. But then there's other things that are conditioned, okay? They are conditioned reflexes. Those are things that we have to learn, okay? The Lord has conditioned me as a husband a lot. <laughs> I have had to learn some things, right, love? I've, I've had to learn some things, and the Lord said, you might have done that one way, but that's not going to work anymore if you like to walk. Uh, so, we there are things that come natural and there are things that are conditioned. Understand this. W not worrying, that's not natural. Okay? Because worry is a sinful nature. Worry is of sin. So worry, as we're born into sin, we're also born into worry. We have to counteract that. How? We need to develop a conditioned reflex, a learned response that we turn to God at the first sign of worry. We literally have to train ourselves to not worry about those things. And look, some of you may be way more spiritual say, well, I just prayed about it one time and it happened. Congratulations, good for you. I guess you got a gold star that day. But for most of us, we have to be conditioned not to worry. There are some things in my life that I just don't get worked up about. Why? Because I've learned over time to trust God with it. I've learned over time and people will say, Aren't you concerned about that? Aren't you worried about that? No, I'm not. One of the things I think that maybe you as a church, whenever you were here at the time, if you were, was a few years back when uh, we were without worship leader, kids leader, youth leader, all three at the same time. And for me, my approach was, God, this one's on you. You're going to have to find the right people at the right time. And I'm not going to rush into bringing anyone in. I'm not going to rush in to do those things. And many people said, so pastor, what are you doing? How are we going to do this? I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just praying and believing that God's going to work it out. And God sustained our church through that. And now we've got all those ministry positions filled. Uh, why? Because 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, cast all your anxiety on him. It, there's not a period there because he cares for you. This isn't, I'm God, cast all your anxiety, all your worry on me because I'm God. No, it says he cares about you. I don't know about you, but I tend to want to be around and do more things for those people who reflect care, love, compassion, support back to me. God wants that from us. Another way to keep your joy this Christmas. Take time to rest. Life gets crazy this time of year, okay? There are presents to buy. There's programs to attend. There's family functions to go to. There's food to prepare. There's all these other things. There's cards to send. There's trees to trim. There's decorations. There's the list goes on and on and on and on about what to do. But here's the thing that we have to realize. You're grumpy when you're worn out. And so am I. We're grumpy whenever we're worn out. Georgia, you can stop shaking your head yes now. 
Thank you, girl. Thank you, my dear. Uh, um, but we have to learn to rest. We have to take time for that. Many of us, we, we love the Ten Commandments. But there's one of those that you struggle with. You're like, yeah, no problem. Thou shalt not murder. Cool. Thou shalt not steal. Got it. Does that count paper clips, Lord? <laughs> I'm not sure where the Lord is on that. I'll find out later. Uh, uh, um, th thou shalt not commit adultery. No problem. But the Lord... But it's also said that six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, we're not going to get into the weeds on this thing about what day it is and what it is. And here's the thing. Understand this. Rest is about recuperating and re-energizing. So for some of us, rest looks like going out super early in the morning, sitting in a deer stand and waiting for something to happen, okay? For some of us, rest looks like sitting down reading a book. For some of us, rest looks like binging Hallmark Christmas movies. I never got that because you already know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what will be a miracle this Christmas season if it's, is if Hallmark or any of the other ones come out with a new plot story. That will be a miracle. But so, so understand this, is that we, we can't think that rest means you've got to sit there, you've got to do nothing, you've got to just sit there and you've got to be with your own thoughts and you've got to do those things. You gotta, that is not what it means. It is time to rest. Time to pour back into self. Time to re-energize self. Okay? But it must require being out of what is normal. Don't tell anyone that work fuels you. Pastor, what about you? I need time off as well. Do I enjoy ministry? Absolutely. It's what I'm called to do. But I've got to get away from ministry and unplug from ministry and do some other things that I find rest in. Rest is so important to our physical, emotional, and spiritual health that God set an example for us. See, we, we are told that God rested on that day, okay? We are told that God, God didn't need to do that. He's God. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. God didn't really need the rest. Jesus didn't really need to be baptized. They modeled those things for us. God modeled rest, Jesus modeled baptism. So if we want to be able to rest more, we have got to be willing to do something different. If we want to have joy and we want to get rid of worry, we've got to be willing to have rest and to take rest. Someone uh, said, and uh, says, says this, if you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Okay? Slow down. Stop. It's okay. Don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. Uh, look, I've got a phenomenal wife. An excellent wife. A wife that loves the Lord and a wife that loves her husband and her children. And I can't for the life of me think why it takes so long to wrap presents. When in a matter of 2.7 seconds, they gone. The paper's gone. But that's something that, sh because we, we've had talk about this. For those of you that don't know, we now live in a fifth wheel. Last year, we lived in a 2,100 square foot house. Wrapping Christmas and coming up with those things, that was easy to figure out. This year, we're like, how are we going to do that? I'm sorry. How is she going to do this? Okay? And so we've had to get creative. But here's what I know is that that is a break for her. Because it's not shopping, it's not cooking, it's not traveling, it's not going to all those other things. She's like, I am here and there's my movies and I'm being left alone and nobody's bothering me. Anyone in here want a guaranteed solution to rest more? Anyone? Does anyone want a guaranteed solution to rest more? Raise your hand if you do. 
Some of you are like, I don't know, Pastor. I've been here long enough. I know your tricks. <laughs> Learn to say no. Learn to say no. Here's what people say. Well, I, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm. Listen. If you feel that someone is asking you something without you having the option to say no, they don't care that much about you. Is this thing on? I don't want to hurt their feelings. Then you also don't want to rest and you also don't want to have joy. Learn to say no. That's how we will have rest. Busyness is an addiction for so many people. I get it. It causes people to feel important. Look at all I can do. But here's the thing is that Whenever we get so busy for so long and we don't get any rest, the people who are closest to us, they take the brunt of it. And then they're like, you need to go hunting. You need to go play golf. You need to go for a drive. You need to go for a... Listen, whenever you hear statements like that, that means you haven't rested and you're grumpy. And so just do whatever is suggested for you. We need to recognize our own limitations and not push ourselves beyond what we can handle effectively. Effectively being the key word there. We feel like we can handle all kinds of things, okay? But how effective can we be at doing it? As different things have come up in my life, oftentimes when I say yes, that usually means I have to say no to something else, okay? I've shared with some of you uh, uh, um, that over the last couple of years, God has been, uh, you know, kind of searching me and seeing whether or not um, me, me trying to figure out whether uh, going to school, I can't really say back to school because I didn't go to Bible college in the first place. That's another story. Uh, but whether or not I should go. And um, I finally listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit after a couple of years um, and next Next month, I'll be starting a master's program for missional leadership. What, what, that means, what that means is that there are some people that I've had to call and say, hey, look, I've got this coming up. I've got to say no to this. Um, for the first time since Will was in second grade, next year, I will not be involved with youth football. That's a passion of mine that drives mine. But I, I know that with this, I have to say no. There's some other things that I've had to step away from. Years ago, I was asked if I would consider leading the ministerial alliance. At the time, Amy's dad was super sick, and I wanted to just make sure that I could care for him, and I had to say no at that time. Later, there came a yes for that. So understand that oftentimes, your saying yes to something means you should be saying no to something else, because you can't do it effectively. No matter how good you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter how how, what, how anointed you are. Well, I'm anointed to do this. You're also commanded to rest. Finally, maybe the simplest, but also maybe the most difficult. Remember the reason. Remember the reason of what this season is. For some, Christmas is about presents. Big presents, expensive presents, lots of presents. And if they can't buy them for people or they don't get the gifts that they want, then they're disappointed and they lose their joy. And there are others, and I tend to fall in this category where Christmas is about family. Christmas is about spending that time together with that and being there uh, 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 to, to see kids open presents and to spend time together and to build memories and, and eating. And oh, Lord Jesus, eating, hallelujah. <laughs> but here's the problem. What about when children grow up? What about when family relationships become strained? What about when we lose loved ones close to us? What about when... Um, the budget can't allow for the gifts from last Christmas to be bought this Christmas? What if those people who you've counted on for something every single year, what if something happened for them and they weren't able to get that for you? Then what? The question then is, is 
how is Christmas going to be joyful? If we remember it's about Jesus, it'll always be joyful. Regardless of the rest of the stuff that is happening. Again, verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. The reason we celebrate Christmas is because we needed a Savior, so God sent his own son so that we would not have to perish. It's, it's okay, even at Christmas, to still remember that Jesus was on a cross. It's okay. You're not taken away from it. You're like, ooh, you know, I, you know, I just feel like I'm rushing it and I'm rushing it. You're not, because we should be thinking about Jesus on a cross every day. Okay? Some, some people have asked and wondered, where's, where's the baby? There's no baby in the manger. There's a couple personal reasons for that that are funny that I might not share, but theologically speaking, the tomb is empty and so is the manger. The tomb is empty and so is the manger. It doesn't make our manger any less if there's no child, baby doll in there, whatever. But the point is, is that we have to remember the reason for this season is Jesus. That God sent his son, a Messiah for us, to provide a way. You want to ultimately know why that baby came, John 10.10 10 tells us. Because the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. If you don't have joy in your life, you're not having an abundant life. It is not about having things. It is not about having people. It is about having joy. And the enemy is trying to steal that joy from you. And so why not this season make a decision that says, Satan, you try to steal enough from me all of the rest of the year. This year, you're not sending that joy because I know that Jesus is the reason. And he wants me to have abundant life. And I can't have abundant life if I don't have joy in my life. What if that was our attitude. So what if things didn't turn out exactly how you want them to for your family celebrations, whenever that is, if that's this week, if that's next Sunday, if that's next Monday, if that's after, so what? Jesus didn't come to give presents, to decorate our houses, to have parties and sit on Santa's lap. It's not why Jesus came. He came so that we would have abundant life, so that we would have joy. Part of that abundant life is eternal life. Eternal life only in Christ. Let me give you a good nugget to leave on this morning. And for some of you, this, this, this is going to sting a little bit. But for some of you, it stung a little bit whenever I first started talking about wise men at the mangers. And for some of you here, you no longer have the wise men in your manger because you want to be biblically accurate. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? They don't show up for like two years later. That stung a little bit for some of us when we first heard that. What does this pastor mean? That's blasphemy, no mangers. Do you know how many wise men I have for this thing? That's fine. Just put them on the other side of the house or something. Put them in another room. They're still on their journey. So, so for some of you, that stung a little bit over the years. For some of you, you're like, how could he not have the baby in the manger? Well, because the tomb is empty and so is the manger. That might have stung a little bit because now you're like, should I go home and take the baby out of my manger? <laughs> if Holy Spirit says to, yeah. And people will be like, where's the baby? You can be like, the tomb is empty and so is the manger. And they're going to think you're super spiritual and they'll never ask about your nativity scene again. But catch this. If your joy seems to be leaving, it's because you've allowed the enemy in. Mm. If, if, If joy is fleeing, 
the enemies at work. And he would love nothing more than for us to lose sight of the reason for this season right here. He would love nothing more than for that to happen. And so maybe it's about testifying more. Maybe it's about getting rid of the worry in your life. Maybe it's about resting more. Maybe it's about just remembering the reason. But whatever it is, if joy is fleeing from you, do something about it. Bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. Take authority in the name of Jesus. I would encourage you that that day when, whenever you know that family's coming and you just know someone's going to test your buttons, you need to pray like you've never prayed that morning and watch what God does. Just watch what God does. Lord, you know that one uncle is coming. And if you're like, huh, you're that uncle. Or aunt. But pray. Because the enemy is going to use people to take our joy. The enemy is going to use situations to take our joy. The enemy is going to use glass and mashed potatoes to take our joy. The enemy is going to use whatever he can. But if you would say, no, the reason is Jesus. I'm going to be joyful Regardless, I'm going to keep my joy this season. Church, would you stand with me this morning? These next few moments, I just want you to just reflect however you need to reflect. Maybe there was something that Holy Spirit's talking to you about that I didn't get in the message. Listen to Holy Spirit. But I would say that these three things are probably going to be one of the leading reasons that joy seems to be missing. That you're not giving your worries to God. That you're not taking time to rest. There was a time that um, I've had people who loved me in my week-to-week life who said, Pastor, you need to rest. You're not impressing anybody because you're at the church six days a week. And... Over time, I've learned personally during the week that it's okay when I'm not here, that it's okay when I take rest. In 2016, I ended up uh, having to take a three-week sabbatical whenever I was in Ohio because I, I wasn't resting before that. And I wasn't the pastor that I should have been at that time. Rest is important. Or maybe it's just that you need to realize it's not about the food, it's not about the parties, it's not about the traveling, it's not about the family, it's not about the presence, it's not about those things. There's, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with those things, but the reason we are here is because of Jesus. He's the reason. So maybe it's one of these three, maybe it's something else. But I hope to encourage you to do all you can as soon as you leave here. To begin to prepare yourself to make sure that every single day that you're keeping your joy. Again, it's not about being happy. It's about being joyful. Because on that Christmas day, when for some of you, the family gets a little stupid, (laughs) you're going to have your joy. Your joy may be found in telling them to leave. (laughs) But if it's your house, that is your place. You are to protect your sanctuary. You are to protect your home. You are to protect your family. Well, what if I hurt their feelings? Their family, they'll get over it. And if they don't, then they're probably not saved. Keep your joy this season. Couples, you're almost across the finish line. We are almost there. Okay? Those of you with with adult children out of the house, 
let me encourage you to just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> they, they're not asking you what gift they should have bought for their child or whether or not they should have went this way. They're not asking you. Let's not be a reason. Ooh, Holy Spirit, this just came. Hallelujah. Let's not be a reason someone loses their joy. Mm, can we agree in that? Let's not be a reason. That's, that wasn't even in my notes, y'all. Let's, let's, let's not be a reason someone loses their joy. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the best thing, the most megas thing that has ever happened to this world. And that joy is found in him and through him and because of him. And let us be reminded of that. God, cause us to say, God, I'm not going to worry about these things. God, that we would literally hand them to you, spiritually speaking. That maybe we need to change some things up this year. Lord, help us to take some time this week, during the day, to just rest. To do something that fuels us. That doesn't cause us to lose joy, that doesn't cause us to be grumpy, that doesn't cause other people to not want to be around us. And Lord, may we just remember that it's about you, Jesus. Jesus, it is about you and why you came to this earth. And you lived your life only to die but then we thank you that you rose again and death was defeated in Jesus' name. Lord, let us keep that in mind. Be with us this week, Lord. Let us encourage other people. Let us bring joy to other people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.